Okay, and welcome back. How's that for a launch for hour number three? It's Monday. That means it's time for our Fukushima Daiichi report and all reactors in Japan and a few here as well with Yoichi Shimatsu. Yoichi is with us every every week, has been for years. We've been covering this for you since 311, which is coming up on four years. The latest official statistics are 15,000 Southern California sea lion pups have died this year. It could be three, four times that. There may not be many left at all. Probably not. And if there are a few left, there'll be less and less until they're virtually gone, if not entirely gone. The extermination event along the West Coast uh, is not abating at all. It is increasing. We're looking at extinctions of all kinds of different animals. Big earthquake just struck uh, Japan. Uh, you there, Yochi? Yeah, I'm in Thailand. Um uh, glad to be out of Japan, where was, uh, radiation is building up uh, since 311, and even in the last few months, last month, we're seeing a rise. Uh, there was a major earthquake in northern Japan, off the coast of Fukushima. To, uh, this morning, about four, uh, this morning in Tokyo, morning over in Asia, about four hours ago, and this was a 6.9 earthquake, nearly a 7 Earthquake, very shallow, very unusual event. I don't know if you heard about it over there. Has it been not not yet. The you're the, no, you're the first person to let us know. I've not seen anything okay. yet. Okay, all right. Yeah, what happened is that the closest point was off of what's called Miyako Iwate, which is uh, two provinces up from Fukushima. But Miyako was a was a town that, if you remember, the 311 uh, tsunami. That huge black wave that went up a river, went up an estuary. Oh, yeah, sure. That's the way houses start. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's where this thing happened, and this quake was 200 kilometers offshore from there. Hmm. Now, of course, when we're talking about radiuses, okay, out to sea that far, it's not much more than 200 kilometers to Fukushima. Uh, in between, uh, near Miyako, there is the Onagawa in Miyagi Prefecture, Onagawa um, nuclear, uh, nuclear plant. It's got three nuclear reactors. Uh-huh. And if you recall back, I did a major report with photo essays on several all across Japan nuclear, uh, uh-huh. uh problems across Japan for yeah. a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I did go out to Onigawa, a very difficult place to reach. The town of Onigawa, which was sort of on this, uh, shallow area between the island and the peninsula there, um, was wiped out completely. You know, uh, it was uh, totally devastated. Only a few buildings left. And only got was further out on the peninsula. Mm. And it was a site of this real mystery on March 12th when uh, it was shut down uh, uh, after the tsunami. Mm-hmm. And uh, NHK World reported, you know, this was sort of a live report by NHK World, that there was a water leak there at Onagawa, radioactive water leak, which meant one of the pipes broke, major pipe broke. Correct. And then the producer rushed to the news anchor that stop, stop it now. And they shut off an HK World satellite broadcast for huh. about five, ten minutes after, uh-huh. five, ten minutes uh-huh. after that. The anchor got on. She was very rattled, you know, very nervous and rattled after that and didn't mention the story again. <laughs> so, uh, later a report came out from Nuclear, Nuclear uh, uh, Regulatory Commission that in fact, that there was a uh, point zero point two zero microsievert reading there, but then the authorities of the Tohoku Electric, this is a different co- co- company than the uh, Tepco, a different company than the Tokyo Electric, they said that well, uh, all that radiation came from Fukushima. You see, we're safe here; nothing really happened. Oh yeah. But then again, a year after that, I was out there. And I'm reading 0.18. This is in the air blowing off the bay there. Okay, right about the cooling bay where the plant is. Mm-hmm. And this is up on a bluff. And this is in the air way mm-hmm. pretty far mm-hmm. away from the bay. I'm getting 0.18. So obviously that mm-hmm. plant plant suffered extensive damage. It had mm-hmm. a major problem 205, 2005. Mm-hmm. There was an earthquake out there where uh, there were ruptures of pipes, the pipes, and then uh, they were denied permission to reopen for a while. So this is a very troubled plant, again, under a veil of absolute secrecy, denial, uh, disinformation. Oh, total, total cover-up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so now we see uh, nearly a 7.0 quake happening very close to an offshore, only 10 kilometers under the seabed. Wow. You know, and quakes are usually happening under do, yeah, do 30, you, 100 kilometers. Did you hear anything about, anything about a tsunami warning? There was a tsunami warning. Uh, just a small wave, uh, 20, 30, you know, uh, one foot tall wave came in. So there wasn't much of a wave. Something very disturbing though about the shallowness of the depth, because that means it's either a volcano is starting to erupt under there, which if that happens could be devastating if a brand new island, you know, starts to emerge, uh, that close to the Japanese shore, because there is volcanic activity, you know, there are under, there are undersea volcanoes. If we're seeing major volcanic activity, we're saying that, you know, we're talking about, you know, up to a dozen nuclear reactors along the Pacific coast will be threatened with all kinds of volcanic ash and all that, you know, coming in. Uh, so it could be major or it could be a major plate rupture. In other words, this thing happening so close to the surface, but the seabed itself is cracking apart. And this could, uh, you know, um, lead to many, many, uh, you know, that's one of the things that sort of holds back major quake action, uh, motion on the, this whole Pacific plate that's sort of rotating. Uh, that would mean, uh, everything along that coast, including off of Fukushima, where the, you know, the Japan mm-hmm. plate, uh, the Japan plate, I mean, the Pacific plate is very close in, the trenches, uh, very close in there. That would mean we're in for a round of massive earthquakes, and that will be, Still, the end of Fukushima number one, number two, the whole works is going to go up. You know? And uh, as you know, it's on liquefaction soil, sitting on a pool of gravel oh, and yeah, 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 sand, yeah. basically, now. You know, but these reactors are basically floating on the water. Yep. And uh, while TEPCO wants to stop the water, if they do, they're hoping it'll settle down straight. We just don't know what. I think they're really afraid that things going to topple. This is like... Uh, I don't know. These, these reactors are really tall. You know, they're tall, narrow cylinders, very heavy. Well, so we once got they start to tilt, there's uh, not going to be anything to stop them from going over, from toppling no, like a giant no. tree, you know, like yeah. a sequoia tree. Yeah, you're right. The, the, they're much the, heavier than a sequoia tree, huh? The weight of these spent fuel pools five stories off the ground yeah. uh, is enormous. Uh, no one talks about yeah. that. I'm, I'm surprised they're still up, frankly. I am. Well, they can't get to them. It's too radioactive to go in these can't, uh, can't go buildings. Can't go into them. Nope. And their their yeah. plans. Yeah. So you for, know, uh, gotta, they got to blow holes through these walls, but that's going to do ma- massive atmospheric releases. Yeah. Which is going to threaten all of northern Japan, all all of Tokyo, Yokohama. You know, half half of Japan will be threatened if they uh, broke through the walls there. Mm-hmm. Not to mention. The fact that a lot of that's going to drift over, you know, to uh, North America and the Arctic and Europe, you know, so there's a dilemma right now. These things are going to go eventually. This this earthquake is ominous because it is very close in, very shallow, very powerful. Uh, in the hour afterwards, and uh, just less than an hour afterwards, uh, there were two major aftershocks, 4.7, 4.6. So this thing is going to keep moving. You know, I mean, yeah, we're talking about that whole region mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. undersea region, is really on the move powerfully. And, of course, yeah, there's nothing anyone can do about this stuff. So it's uh, it's just a really bad place to have 15 reactors along that coast. You know, it doesn't make any sense. There's all those uh, totally we, we, uh, that fuel pools. Yeah, 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 yeah. We did a story on Friday. Rods. I mean, yeah, one more. This is a recipe for major global disaster. And basically, I said, if this, you know, you know all, it, it doesn't take much. We're right on the verge of not just an extinction event in the North Pacific. We're on uh-huh. the verge of an extinction event over the Northern Hemisphere. We're talking uh-huh. about human extinction. We're not talking about a few uh-huh. sea creatures, a few million sea creatures. We're talking uh-huh. about a few hundreds of millions of people, you know, a billion people wiped out. That's how close we are, and people are sitting on their hands, you know, imagining. I don't know what people are doing now. Going to movies, playing golf, playing tennis. I think they better start figuring out what they're going to do about Fukushima and start demanding action from the government and no more lies and demand some action and put a major task force on the ground. You know, I mean, this is ridiculous. You know, what, what, uh, that this thing has gone four years now. Absolutely nothing's in them. Everything that's been tried has failed. Um, we still, we're still getting nothing but lies, deceit, 
you know, uh, deception mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. silence, this has got to end because otherwise, you know, we got nothing. We, there's no one else to blame. I mean, everyone, everybody bears the blame for their own extinction. You know, watch your kids die. You know? I mean, that's a, watch your spouse die there. Watch yourself die. You mean we're coming very close. <laughs> this earthquake is very, very, very ominous. Yeah, and, uh, well, I, I concur. I concur. Yeah. We have uh, another problem we've had in it. Yeah. Go, go ahead. Yeah. The other thing out your way, we've had this milky ash fall down, and some people they can't figure out where it came from. The dirty rain. Uh, some people are saying it probably came from southern Japan, Kyushu, Sakurajima, mm -hmm. which is blew its top on uh, January 28th, and then mm -hmm. again in February. Mm -hmm. I flew right over that. It's a massive volcano on the way back from Japan. I flew over right before it exploded. Hmm. You know, some massive creature. It's a you know, active volcano. Mm -hmm. And uh, Satsuma Sendai reactor is only 50 kilometers, less than 50 kilometers, very close to this place, about 30 kilometers. It's very, very close uh, to the Sakurajima volcano, which is, you know, really starting to blow its lid now. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are two Mitsubishi boiling uh, steam, steam, uh, steam reactors. A pressurized steam reactor. Those things, oh, you know, that's the other half of Japan gone, basically. All of Japan's wiped out. Yeah, you know, yeah. Those things, those two, it's the end of Japan, per se. There's no, nowhere to run. You know, all the people in Tokyo, are, oh. it's like the, it's not the sound of one hand clapping like Fukushima. This is going to be the sound of two hands clapping the mosquito called Tokyo. You mean, well, what's going to happen to the... that happens... Uh, we, we're going to lose the 2020 Olympics, Yoshi? Oh, can't have that happen. Oh, uh, no way, no way, no way. I mean, unless this, if they want the Olympics, they're going to have to just, I mean, really start seriously shutting down all <laughs> nuclear plants, moving the nuclear fuel out. It ain't going to happen. Or something it ain't like not going to happen. If they don't do that, we are, like, uh, there may not be, a, you know, Tokyo in 2020. Yeah. We're not talking about you know, no Tokyo Olympics. There not, may not be a Tokyo in 2020. So, mm -hmm. uh, in these events, this mega, a volcanic explosion and this huge quake that just occurred, a harbinger that Japan is coming apart. It's in time of, we're entering an era of geo, geophysical instability, you know, in which everything breaks apart and new mm -hmm. land is formed. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's, there's uh, 50 nuclear reactors sitting on site at where this thing is happening, and uh, they're sitting on their hands. No one wants to do anything. I tell you, this is a world emergency. I think the Australians and Canadians are going to have to take those spent fuel rods and right. store them somewhere because otherwise they're going to lose everything too. You know, you, everyone's going to have to sacrifice here. Canada's we did a, yeah, we did a program. A uh, thousand square kilometer zone and just say, we gave you the uranium. We'll yeah. take back the uranium. We're going to have a national sacrifice zone in northern California, uh, northern uh, Canada, uh -huh. the size of a major province of uh -huh. Canada uh -huh. will be inaccessible to human beings for the next million years. And that's the way it's got to yeah. be because we made a huge mistake of sending uranium across the world. And now we've got to take it back because if they don't make the sacrifice, they're all going to be gone. They're all going to be dead. Just, yeah. We did a, did a program. Are did the a pro walruses are dying. Everything else up there is dying. That's People right. Are next. That's right. We did a program Friday about... Uh, San Onofre, and the, the average person thinks that San Onofre has been pretty well taken care of because it's been decommissioned. Oh, no, nothing could be further from the truth. The radioactive uh, fuel is still the there. The it's all there. No, no, I did, it didn't. You never stop having to maintain these facilities in a state of decommission. Yeah. Tremendous expense. Yeah, where are they going to yeah. Where are you going to put the fuel rods? I mean, the same thing. Well, they're trying to get them out of there. They're still they, leakage. They're still there. They, they, people want them out. But where are they going to take them? They should have taken them to Yucca Mountain. Uh, they should have opened that facility. Uh, done it right. Yeah. Found somewhere. But uh, they didn't. And they're not going to. Here, uh, yeah. let's go up and talk to uh, Dana yeah, Durnford. Yeah, I mean, and, there's, a, there's a sad thing, a sad thing, Jeff, about Yucca Mountain. It hasn't been near Las Vegas. And Las Vegas has got the clout. I mean, what comes first in America? Survival? Or uh, gambling. You know, California? Yeah, and all, and all the, and not everything that lives in California, the survival life for gambling. What's more important, the slot mm. machine or your children? Well, they voted there, Yucca Mountain. You know, slot machines come before anything. That's yeah? so, right. 
So, you know, yeah, we're living in a society which is so utterly corrupted, morally depraved. We yeah. are living in a modern Sodom and Gomorrah. So we are. I was going to just say that. And That's just exactly what right. what happened in those places. Yeah. yeah. And the volcano took them out. Well, we're sitting on the lip. We're dancing like damn fools on the lip of a volcano that is blowing up. And this is the nature well, of this civilization it. we live in now. And when it's all gone, they can't blame nature. Yeah, They're not going to blame the sea lions. They're not going to blame the fish. They're not going to blame the birds. They are to blame, you know, the people who are willing to put gambling, gambling with their children's lives ahead of fundamental safety for every species on this planet. Uh, exactly so, right. Yeah. Morally depraved, morally depraved, and this is why I think people with an ounce of morality got to start taking over. We just can't let these blind I don't know how they're going to do it, but you're, you're right, are. you're right. Uh, we got uh, Dana I Dernford mean, yeah. standing by, uh, Yoshi. Let's uh, go go good up and say hello. Good, good to hear you back. Yeah. Let's go, yeah, yeah. Let's go up and say hello to Dana. Are you there, Dana? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, lovely Yoshi. That was spectacular. He's right. We got to tip yeah. this whole industry and drop it on its head over and over and over. Correct. Because it's not going to go willingly. And I think that's what's going to happen in 2015. I think people are, when you wake up a mass of people, they're going to be so angry. They're going to be looking for heads, not answers, just heads. Correct. And Yoshi nailed it right on the head. Yeah. Where, what are we doing? What, you know, everybody out there who has the ability and think that they're insignificant or something, look at Jeff. Jeff's just a single individual. Look at Yoshi. Yoshi's just a single individual. And look what they have accomplished. Look how many people they have informed and educated. I mean, really, if you're sitting there and you're listening to Jeff and Yoshi and myself, you really got to consider you're, you're no different. You're one person. And you can really, truly, if you put your set your soul on and make a difference in many mm -hmm. different ways. And, of course, I'm up on the West Coast. I just ran in to catch the show tonight and they get a little break tie up to a wharf. I just covered 670 nautical miles in a little under two and a half days on the inside channels and the wow. channels are about half a mile wide on the average. And the idea was to look for flocks of birds, do another run around where I was waiting for the tide to get back to the daylight. Uh -huh. So I hit tide at uh, low tide, but uh -huh. you need daylight to pull that off. And so I decided I got a few days to wait before the tide gets back into the daylight cycle. And I, and I had a brilliant idea. I'd go up all these channels I probably would never get to and run through them and find a flock of birds. There had to be a flock of birds there somewhere because I can't find them, folks. I, I don't know what to make of it, and everybody I talk to don't know what to make of it. And, you know, this... 300 species of birds roughly along the coastline and you can't find a flock of birds so literally every mile you should find a flock of birds a thousand two thousand three thousand birds diving and feeding and the idea is once again to put cameras on the water and see what they're feeding on but we can't find a flock of birds that is unimaginable that that's inconceivable something very visible and something that i think most people i mean there's a a huge uh, industry of during bird watching, and yet we don't see any of uh, these uh, people talking about it. Maybe i got to try to reach out to them. But not to have no birds. This summer there was no insects. This year there's nothing on the coastline. And whatever is deer, it's so scarce. you really got to hunt for it. To get up on the beaches with a camera in your hand, you've got nothing to take a picture of on your rock. And that is not no. the way British Columbia is supposed to be. As no. Everybody that might have visited British Columbia would know. And the weather has broken, Jeff, and we're about to hit the big one, uh, the Queen Charlotte Islands. Uh -huh. uh, it looks like nine days of good weather. And that's something that's famous right around this entire planet. And this whole coastline is Canada. Canada's notorious for uh, prestigious coastlines, just beautiful, maintained, and people stay basically away from all the coastlines except for sure. the passing fishermen. And so you can't find a species on the coastline. Like Yoshi said, the humans are, are right on the same level as everything else. So if everything else disappears, that means we have to disappear too. 
we haven't got time to sit around anymore. We haven't got time to to consider, you know, how we're going to get an alternative source. We need just to go ahead and do it. We need to treat it as immediately well, coming Absolutely out, so right. We, yeah. we, we can't wait. We can't go to the government. We can't wait for any organization at no. all. None. Uh, it's, no, we, we just got to do it. The, the, uh, the issue I would ask you, we have a report that 15,000 sea lion pups have died along the Southern California coast. Now, the, who knows how accurate that is? It could be 50,000. There could be none left. We don't know. They're obviously on the way to extinction. That's what's happening. There's no question about it. And no one's talking about it. Nobody will say radiation. They just keep talking about unknown, strange things. Uh, it's very frustrating. They equate it with, um, and they don't come up with an actual diagnosis. They don't come up with an actual pathogen or disease. No, never. Virus or anything. They, they just say it could be. And that seems to me enough to pacify every single person out there that is not following the Fukushima side of it and putting that into the equation too. So anybody who's not familiar with Fukushima immediately goes along with what they say, but anybody that's familiar with Fukushima immediately says, hey, they never said radiation. And I talked to a lot of people up here and I discovered my first question now I ask people is, are you familiar with the melted reactors in Japan? They always say yes. And then I say, um, how many reactors are melted in Japan? They always say what? Because they don't know. <laughs> they don't know. They really don't know. No. no. And they're not offended by it because I always try to educate them. Yeah. It just seems like everybody's, like Yoshi was saying earlier, you know, football or just la 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 land. And it, you can't break through to that. If you said to them, maybe you know, Al Qaeda's around the corner, they're going to get you. I, they probably run away screaming. No, but yeah, if no you doubt. Radiation, no, this they, they, they can't see it, they can't feel it, they can't touch it. Uh, all they hear are stories. Uh, they hear about a few dead fish, dead birds. They don't know. But my goodness, us, I'll never forget when you were on this program uh, last summer, last fall, talking about no insects. That uh, told me a ton, a ton. Yeah. No birds. Now you get, you get. 100,000 dead birds on a couple of different beaches up there in British Columbia. I forgot the species now. It's it's the pups, the sea lion pups, though, in Southern California that need to make people aware that the radiation and the North Pacific current is coming down and hitting California right smack in the middle. And... Uh, it's it's getting grim. We're looking at enormous losses of life that have already occurred that no one is talking about. Nobody except us. Hold on, we'll come right back in just a couple. Okay, let's get right back to business. Uh, Yochi, one of the things I mentioned to Dana oh, a couple of weeks ago when you were not here was... The uh -huh. reaction from the people along the British Columbia coast, they're beginning to realize uh -huh. something is very, very wrong. And I've asked him, and yeah. he's already he's already doing this, wherever he can, he goes to these small towns and talks to people. Tell, tell us more, Dana, about what's going on up there. And I, I, I don't want to harp on this, but the lack of insects is an enormous indicator, huge. Yeah, the insects on this coastline would normally drive you back onto your boat and chase you away right away. Huh. Um, and then the low tide zone itself would normally be a treacherous place for insects because of all the bacteria and that, that yeah. is evaporating and drying out in the sun. And so it was a huge place for flies, a huge, a huge for insects, but also a lot of indigenous insects for the shoreline itself. Well, they break and down all the organic matter. That's what they eat. That's what they right. do. And right. there's nothing for them to feed on. No, there's nothing there. There's nothing. There's zero on the shoreline. You get there with a knife and you couldn't scrape enough off to make a soup out of it for one person. Uh, the DNA of everything is missing. You can't collect DNA of anything. And it, it's a really staggering, it's a very surreal environment when you're out here by yourself and you're out there in the middle of nowhere and you're isolated. Uh, but go back to the communities, I guess. 
I did talk to some of the gooey duck divers. These are $25,000 an hour divers. Uh, real money, Jeff, $25,000 wow. an hour. Kid you not. And it might be double that depending on what you get at the auction block for that stuff. Uh, and they're, head, they, they're heading over. I ran into a whole bunch of them. And mm-hmm. I'm going to raft up when I'm going to go over there and use them as a floating fuel station because they've got uh, all the luxuries, obviously. And so they have packers, big ships going back and forth all the time with water and fuel. Uh-huh. I'll be able to accommodate that in Queen Charlotte's. It's a very fortunate break for me. And it's a big family, really, and I happen to fit in there. Now, the natives in the communities out there, they get they get really upset, and the, the skepticism is not in their eyes at all because they live in the environment. So they, they understand there's nothing there, but I'm able to bring it together into a package for them, and that really, truly gets far around them. I got a lot of hope for the native community in, uh, communities in British Columbia. I really do. I think they might just be the leapfrog for the whole planet. Um, and if I can find the right people and get them on a camera and get them to tell their story of, of the difference, uh, and I'm trying to get myself invited. I know this sounds a bit odd, but I'm trying to get myself invited to their fest, their feast. Sure. And just to get to know them and then get, yeah. get, and I want to actually, uh, do, um, ask a lot of the communities. I just come up with a great idea was to go around to all the communities over the next couple of months as I'm here and ask, for somebody who ate mussels in the last four years, and uh-huh. because they would eat mussels all the time uh-huh. uh, naturally, uh-huh. and actually find somebody who had ate, eaten mussels in the last four years off that particular coastline from the low tide zone. And I think that'll be quite the challenge. And what's going to end up happening is going to be pre-2011, will, most likely will be the only ones I'm hearing from. But I think that could be that's attainable, because you're looking at a little community of about 170 people. Uh-huh. And so it should be, you know, there's, Nasty weather right now. It's hard to do anything, but the right. weather is breaking. Well, uh, what, what's think, what, what's happening down here? We literally did not have a winter in Oregon. Uh, it it well, was just last year we had a couple of days minus three, minus four, which was was rather unusual. We'll get down in the teens. Uh, this year it's sixty five degrees today. Uh, we've had two periods of intense rain. That's it. Uh, virtually no snowpack on the surrounding mountains. Nothing. And in the east here in the U.S., well, you've seen the weather, or you've heard about it. It's just uh, a one constant deluge of snow. Everything is uh, ass backwards. What I'm suggesting here is the spring along the British Columbia coast is going to be vastly different. It, more each year. But this year, I think even the locals, and when you have 170 people in a small community, they are vibrating in total resonance with the land, I should think. And they're going to notice something, I think, this spring. I'm projecting here, but that is going to be uh, very upsetting to them. I think so because you can't miss that big red dinky coming in all these harbors and taking off the next morning just after sunrise over and over and over. Because that's what i got a tendency to do now is get in and tie up to a wharf somewhere at nighttime. I'm a little... I'm a, I had a little too much of that out there by myself tied up at nighttime getting caught in storm stuff. And so <laughs> I'm starting to go in the ports out in the middle of nowhere. Right, but I'm starting to realize because people come up and talk to me when they get a chance and ask me what I'm doing because they see me come in at night and then I take off again early the next morning and no one gets a chance to talk to me. That's not an accident. That's to get your curiosity up. Yeah. And so you keep going back in and then when I start to talk to them, they actually understand what you're really doing because you see you coming and going, coming and going. And you're a very mm-hmm. odd man in that barrel of pickles because they don't get many visitors. Yeah. Um, but the insects, I think, you know, they're all going to be educated by this spring, that's for sure. I'm going to have my way with that, and it takes time to do what I'm trying to pull off here, but I'm going to hit every community, and I am, get them acclimated to me, and then get in tight with that community enough that I can do a presentation and get them up to speed. Yeah. And, and make and sure, sure they stay in touch with you so that when you do go back home, uh, you'll be able to email them or otherwise get in touch with them and, and ask how ooh. things are. This is this ooh, would be ooh, crucial. Ooh, ooh. I got one community down there that wants to go out and collect stuff for me. So hey, that's, that's good what I'm job. saying. I got the yeah. boot in there, and they also want to know if there's anything. They got a house down there I could use. I just, I just remembered that, and it's just because all the bad weather got blown up the other side of the coast, and then I made a run up the inside channels looking for birds, 
And I just pulled in the Rupert here so I can get the telephone call tonight. I'm a busy, it's unbelievable how busy I really truly am. Yeah. It's nonstop from the moment I wake till the moment I sleep. It's just fatigued each night yeah. to the point now where I can't catch up on anything. The last seven, eight, nine days I haven't been able to just, I just get through each day and I can't compile anything or have any synopsis or make a video. Well, you're, you're doing the work of uh, ten people. Yochi, what about uh, insects? Now, we've seen deformities. We've seen photographs. What about insects and birds yeah. and general levels of wildlife activity on eastern uh, eastern Japan along uh, Fukushima Prefecture and other areas nearby? Has yeah. there been a change? Well, most of Oh, yeah, absolutely. Most of the birds... Now, Fukushima was a very living province. It was a area of forest, that, uh, mountains that rushed to the sea, a lot of water, a lot of life. But insects started dying in that first year, in that first uh, uh, few months. There were massive kill-offs of species, and the, and the build-up in their yeah. bodies where, you know, you see insect shells all over the place. So right now, not a lot of uh, the local endemic birds. It's like migratory... Uh, passing through, uh -huh, uh -huh. and I'm afraid that they may be passing through very quickly because they've got nothing to eat there. So same same thing here. Harm them as much. Yeah, same thing here. Exactly. They've got a. But the problem is, is you know that's part of their uh, pathway. They have to eat along the way. You know, lose a bit, sleep a bit, uh, get their rest, eat a little bit uh, to you know get the sugars they need. Yeah. So it, this is going to be devastating over the years. Yeah. I'm uh, yeah. We have to take a break here. Just a minute. We'll come right back. I'm uh, I'm really okay. appalled at how few uh, indigenous birds there are uh, to see anymore. Even mm -hmm. in the spring and summer, we used to have red-winged blackbirds all over the place. Uh, even orioles. You, you name it. Finches of all kinds. I I didn't see any last yeah. year, and it's going to be uh, worse no. this year. There's no question. None. These are migratory. Some of them. They fly long distances and. Uh, as you say, nothing to eat along the way, and they either perish or they keep flying. Yeah. Uh, it's a simple one. Hold on, we'll uh, come right we back. We are seeing, uh, yeah, one thing, Jeff. We are seeing a lot of Japanese species down in Thailand. They're, they've migrated. Oh, they've, down they've the migrated Paris south. Uh, interesting. All right, yeah. stand, uh, stand by just a minute. They're all good. They've got to stay. Yeah, with. yeah. We'll be right back. Okay, let's get uh, back and wrap up with uh, Dana so he can get some rest. He'll be out uh, at it early again tomorrow. What do you want to add, Dana, to this? Thanks, Jeff. Um, that's true. I do want to crash and burn. It's going to be up early tomorrow morning and gone yeah. again. Um, all you tell people is that, once again, you know, get informed. And remember, when someone don't believe that there's an issue, you tell them. We've never seen a multi reactor on this planet before, and there's mm -hmm. three in Japan, and they're right on the ocean. Everybody needs to confront anybody who's not willing to have that debate. Mm -hmm. There's no time for games anymore, like Yoshi said, starting off. The time for games is gone. It's time to get it back in people's faces. And one of my supporters put an ad in the, in the local newspaper in America for the nuclearproctologist.org. Very and nice. I thought that was absolutely brilliant, and who knows, you know, maybe that's the beginning of the revolution itself, for sure. Good night for everybody. Good night. Okay, Yogi. Dana, good night. Yeah. Thank you, my friend, for your support. It's important, and thank you. Indeed. Okay. Take care. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, here he goes. Uh, Yochi, the, uh, the issue of bringing knowledge to people who are being kept literally diverted and in the dark is not easy uh in japan well, i, I well, get this i get this. go ahead I, I just wish there were more people like dana out there you know out there taking uh, you know making field, field, field research informing their community with the facts you know rather than the deception countering the deception yeah he's done a remarkable job this is life i mean not, not to mention just the sheer physical endurance, you know, the, the suffering uh, he, he's, out there. The guy, the, the guy is, he's uh, old. yeah, he's, he's, look, he's got, he's on leg braces. He can't walk without, uh, crutches. Yeah. He's alone on this boat, uh, this zodiac out in the middle of these incredibly yeah. rough, rough seas. I mean, it's just, it's, it's the stuff of yeah. movies. I mean, and legends. 
Yeah, I mean, I hope someone does make a movie of him. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is just incredible what he's done. And anyone who's been out on the... You know, I've been outside San Francisco Bay. It's a nightmare out there on some days. Yeah. You know, uh, just yeah. for a few hours, I cannot imagine him being out there for you know, months. It's just uh, yeah. it's a superhuman uh, endurance feat, great seamanship, great knowledge of the sea. And if yeah. anyone understands that ocean... Is Dana? Yeah, he's a you know, professional uh, diver, commercial right. diver. This is this is his mother. This is this is the environment that he knows, and uh, and it's just curious that there are academics, people who dare call themselves scientists, who just you know, without doing any research at all on their own, just offhandedly say, "Oh, uh, uh, nothing's happening out there." Well, go out to the ocean like Dana. I'd like to see them out on a boat, you know, in the water. And, uh, looking at the death all around them and come back and say that, uh, with a good conscience. It's just amazing what he's been up against. So, yeah. there's uh, nothing but praise for Well, so. uh, and you too. Well, are you coming back over to the States this year, do you think? Uh, well, it's tough for me because, you know, we're, we're trying to step up this, uh, stuff about the Tokyo Olympics, trying to get people yeah, to see yeah. that this is not, it's not going to happen. And I, you know, and I hope or national committees around the world uh, will respond. I hope the American committee and, uh, will respond and not just be an arm of the State Department, which is to all the misgivings about Shinzo Abe's militarism, his maniacal stuff, I hope the State Department does encourage the Olympic Committee to make their own decision based on the health of the athletes and doesn't make a political interference. Uh, with the, you know, the, the America's healthiest, strongest, fastest kids don't deserve to go to Tokyo. And I tell you, man, I told you I got radiation burns on my arm. And they're all the way up to my elbow, you know, these white spots Unreal. that I've been treating with herbs. Tokyo is dangerous. That was at the tennis court, the outdoor t- tennis court, which is right under an incinerator. Uh-huh. So, oh my God. So they're going to have, they're going to have athletes. Tokyo. If they, if they go through with this, it's quite clear unless something yeah. radical happens, they're going to have a lot of athletes who are sick there. And then how are they going to do their best? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're going to whisk them in and whisk them out. But that's not going to help because they got to still fly in the airspace over Japan. Right. And, you know, and, and, the pl- and the planes that I ride there, I, you know, I don't want, I take those of the readings in the bathroom because I don't want to scare everybody, you know? I mean, it's that bad, you know, massive. Massive, you know, uh, two, uh, micro receivers to the buff, you know, alarm going off. You know, it's, it's, it, these kids are going to have to go to a gauntlet of this stuff over the Pacific or wherever they're coming from, over the Arctic. It, 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 yeah, I can't see sending, you know, kids between the ages of 16 and young adults up to what, in their mid 20s, sending them into this death zone. I call these the games of death. We are playing games of death. We've got to move the Olympics. There is no doubt about that. So, I hopefully I can get back to the states. But you know, right now, uh, sad to say, the U.S. Olympic Committee would probably be the last to decide for the health of their athletes. You know, the so-called freest country in the world yeah. is not going to give their athletes yeah. the freedom oh, yeah. to have a healthy life, that a freedom to have children of their own, freedom to you know be healthy. No, they're not going to let the, allow that freedom. For their young athletes, so, so you know, I don't want to hear any more from the State Department about uh, there's no freedom here, no freedom there. Until so the freedom is practiced in the United States of America, yeah. I would like to see Washington tend to their own business, tend to their own garden. And uh, as far as I can tell, Alaska, Washington State, Oregon, California, all the way over to the Rocky Mountains are still a part of the United States position. Deal by itself. You know, America's got to attend to its own problems with this radiation and deal with, it, with every influence it has. America's got more influence on Japan than any other country in the world. All other countries in the world combined, America has got to start acting for its own citizens, the health and welfare and right. the uh, life uh, of their own citizens. Exactly and correct. They start with the Olympics, yeah. but I would like to see them start right now with that. That front line, the thin red line there on the uh, West Coast, where American citizens are being exposed and 
basically intentionally by a government that is in well, the of course it is. of the nuclear industry and the banks that own the nuclear industry, so and the utilities that own the nuclear industry. But let's not kid around. Let's not hear any more you know, benign, sanctimonious talk about freedom in this world, democracy in this world, until there's freedom and democracy in the United States of America. And, uh, so that's one reason. What's the point of going back? And, you know, no state I understand. Well, you have, you have your hands country. full there. What is what? the point? What I'm concerned yeah, exactly. about, yeah, but, we got to find yeah. countries that will object, yeah, that will stand yeah, for right. their people. What I'm concerned about is that uh, Japan is banking on the Olympics as a massive public relations yeah. score to try and put Japan back yeah. in the minds of people as being perfect, beautiful, clean, safe, happy, and all the rest of it. Uh, if you're in the way, you got to be careful. All right. I mean, really careful. You got to be pragmatic. You know the game. You know the dangers. You're, you're absolutely correct. We're talking about property business. There's a lot of rundown islands out there, which are basically industrial for very lousy industries, warehouses, and the yeah. poor. You should see the very sad, sallow faces of the poor people uh, who I ride the it. buses on those islands and yeah. get to work. These are people who are exposed to radiation. We have really crappy jobs, no income, not happy at all riding the bus, and uh, they want to build atop this very depressed part of Tokyo and turn it into some sort of paradise. And I tell you, when I take readings of 0.36 on these islands, I can see Tokyo Disneyland right from where I'm starting. Fantasyland is right there. Yeah. Really? So let's wow. not kid around. Tokyo yeah. Disneyland is radioactive. Let us not joke around here. And people from all over the world go there. All these young kids, you know, teenagers who work as dancers, hosts, guys, yeah. and all that. Yeah. They're all being killed. They're being, it's, essentially, it's manslaughter. It's, I mean, that's a nice way to put the word well, murder. Yeah. It is a form of socially sanctioned murder, economically sanctioned murder that's going on. So. I didn't I'm know uh, it was that, that close there. to the harbor. Uh, that's, uh, sick. Oh, yeah, it's right on the bay. And there's, uh, the Rincon Park is a major, uh, water, uh, this is basically a good dig up flat. They did what? Uh, we may have lost, uh, lost our man in Japan there. We got into touchy subject, uh, the Olympics. Okay, well, we may not get him back. Uh, I guess the most important thing I can do at this point is, is remind all of you that just because this story is not being talked about in the mainstream media, uh, it makes it all the more important for you to stay up to date on. And you can do that certainly uh, right in the center column at the top of rents.com. And I hope you'll go there. It's your website. I do this for you uh, to try and give you the information that you need so you can make better decisions and ask better questions, as Bill Deagle always says. The headlines are always up there at the top, the permanent Fukushima page on the right-hand side. Do take advantage of it. Hit forward. Send stories around. Uh, Navy sailors suffer horrors of Fukushima radiation, the top story. Then we talk about the baby sea lions along the uh, Southern California coast. Uh, they may be gone by next year. I mean, permanently. The only ones left may be some of the older ones. Fukushima is changing the world environment. No question about it. All right, we thank you for being here, and we will be back for you tomorrow night with more, and I hope you can join us. In the meantime, uh, don't get depressed. Get active, and we'll talk to you tomorrow night.